Welcome to week 16 of the Vez. Let's get this one done. Let's do it. We're going to answer the question, how did small, highly connected communities shape the spirit of the jazz, the jazz age? So, although a lot of people understand social network analysis and how it is very much a part of our modern world and many people do not understand how throughout all of history relatively small groups and networks have had a huge role in the mood and ideas of history and, and events um, and the roaring 20s are remembered as the time of aesthetic and social change and that change was made by surprisingly small groups of creative minds. Um, and so we're going to look at, at three groups that kind of shape the, the spirit of the jazz age. Firstly, we're going to look at Paris and the Lost Generation. And in that Paris and Lost Generation, we're also going to talk about the social network analysis theory. Then we're going to go to London, kind of moving across Europe here. Actually, it would be do, do, do. That's how we're moving across Europe. Make it a little triangle, kind of. Um, and we're going to look at the bright young people in London. And then third, we're going to go to Berlin and look at the Bauhaus movement. And, and look at how all these relatively small groups of creative people really gave us the mood and the aesthetic that we connect with the 20th century. So first, let's go to Paris and let's look at the lost generation. Um, so, after World War I, a bunch of Americans flocked to Paris um, because it was both affordable and it was really elegant. And you wanted to go to Paris because that's the center of art and everyone's kind of there. All your creative authors and artists are there. Um, and so there's a really highly connected group of creatives that live in Paris and they kind of all um, gather in places like Gertrude Stein's house and at Shakespeare and Co. Um, and people like F. Scott Fitzgerald and Ernest Hemingway um, are, are kind of the people that come to Paris in the lost generation and create the mood during this time. And as we talked about last week, we looked at Dadaism and Absurdism as kind of responses to the violence in World War I. Um, and there's also a spirit during the 20s that we're going to look at. And this is kind of carpe diem spirit of the day um, where people are filled with, with this joy. They have no idea what's coming around the next corner. Um, in the 30s and 40s with World War II and the Great Depression um, and there's this this spirit um, and as it says in Ecclesiastes 1 verse 2 it says vanity of vanities all is vanity and in this generation in Paris especially um, it's this generation that kind of encapsulates this worldview of everything's vanity um, and and like Solomon they all kind of come to the conclusion that you just have to live a simple life um, and nothing else will really bring you joy you're gonna keep searching and searching um, and nothing is gonna, gonna bring you joy um, and people like Ernest Hemingway are influenced by this Ecclesiastes idea and he writes the book, The Sun Also Rises, following this ecclesiastical vision. Um, so what, what exactly filled the 20s with this spirit of joy and creativity? Well, I'm going to look at how these small groups of people, like people in Paris, really emerged and came to personify this era. Um, so to understand kind of why these small groups of people have such a big impact, we have to go back to the social network analysis theory by Louis Namier. And he is a British historian who has a really unique approach to history. So um, Namier 
carefully mapped out all these social connections um, and kind of came to the conclusion that social connections um, kind of shaped a person, right? So if you don't have a lot of information about um, a person in history, you can look at their social connections and kind of come to conclusions about what their political beliefs were um, and what activities they were involved in and all this stuff by looking at um, context and connect social connections. And he, name year really comes before um, a lot of the stuff that's going on today. Um, we kind of are still using this um, social network analysis theory through like social media, um, right? The, I don't even know how to explain this, but like basically people are tracking us and um, technology knows our social groups and our social spheres and then gears add towards um, what they think we may like based on other people around us and what they like um, and it's still very prominent today and it's this um, study called prosopography um, and it Lauren Stone explains it as um, an investigation of common characteristics of a historical group whose individual biographies may largely may be largely untraceable. And Stone says that prosopological research has the goal of learning about patterns of relationships and activities through the study of collective biography. So, ending Un ugh. understanding prosopography helps us understand um, the thesis, right? It helps us go back to the fact that relatively small groups and networks um, became highly influential and shaped the 20s and made them what we know today. So now we can really go into Paris and why Paris was a center and a really influential part of the 20s. So, post-World War I, as I mentioned previously, all these Americans are coming to Paris. And why is that, right? Because today Paris is super expensive. Um, but in the post-World War I era, Paris's monetary, not Paris's, France's monetary policy had made big changes and basically caused deflation in simplest terms. So France was sitting on a lot of money, people were saving more than they were spending, and therefore the prices of everything was going down. So it was really cheap to live there. Um, and so young Americans came to Paris and they lived off of family money and they just kind of painted and like wrote books and just kind of it was the center of this creative vibey place that was Paris in the 1920s um but a lot of Americans expatriates kind of felt lonely right you're in this new country you don't have your family there or your friends from America there and so people like Gertrude Stein noticed this need and they kind of become hostesses and Gertrude Stein really becomes this hub and this creative spot her house her doors are always open to anyone that wants to come and so all these creatives become friends with Stein um, and she she's really hospitable and Gertrude actually has a huge collection of art or had I guess she's dead now um, but she had this huge collection of art on her walls that is now worth like millions probably billions of dollars um, because all these artists who she befriended and who spent a lot of time at her house would gift her with artwork and she would hang it on her wall and a lot of these artists were people that <laughs> later became super um, famous and their artwork became worth a lot of money like Matisse and Picasso were some of Gertrude's friends 
Um, so her, her house is kind of the center, this hub of creativity, and then there's also Shakespeare and Co., um, which is a bookshop in Paris that a lot of people go to, and it's a gathering spot. But in Paris, basically people like um, Ernest Hemingway go there, and F. Scott Fitzgerald, and all these influential writers, and they create, kind of create the aesthetic, aesthetic, aesthetic of the era. Um, and now let's move to London and the bright young people in London. So the bright young people were this group of aristocratic, wealthy young people that all kind of partied together. Um, and they became really um, influential because the press was really intrigued by them. And so they covered the bright young people as they became known. Um, in tabloids and stuff and yeah the bright young people is actually a nickname given to um the aristocratic socialites and this group of people would do things like have dress parties fancy dress parties and go on scavenger hunts at night in london um and do some alcohol and, and drugs together so, as you can imagine, it was a pretty fun scene, um, and journalists just ate this up. People like Nancy Mitford, um, Anthony Powell, and John Bet Benjamin, and Evelyn Waugh, who wasn't part of the young, bright people himself. He covered them, and he his works are really well known. Um, like Vile Bodies, for example, is kind of a satirical novel on the London aristocratic scene. And then there's also Cecile Beaton, who was part of the Bright Young People, and he was a photographer that give us a look at what people looked like. Yeah, and his career was all about covering the Bright Young People. And... Evelyn Waugh says that there was, between the wars, a society, cosmopolitan, sympathetic to the arts, well-mannered, above all, ornamental, even in bizarre ways, which for want of a better description, the newspapers called High Bohemian. And this is a description of London's high society. From Waugh. Also, who names their kid Evelyn? I'm sorry. That's just not, I don't know. I don't know. It's just weird. Um, also, part of this group is fun group called, not fun group, fun family, the Mitfords. They had six daughters. There was Unity, Jessica, Diana, Nan Nancy. It has to be Nancy. Nanny? It says Nanny in my notes, but I'm pretty sure it's Nancy and Deborah. Anyway, these girls were part of the bright young people society, and um, they all kind of had really interesting lives. And I could go probably on for a long time talking about each of them individually, but that would take another 20 minutes, and that would suck. But <laughs> actually, some I'm just going to like cover a few of them because they're very interesting. Um, Diana Mitford, she was a British fascist, and she had this really big scandal when she, like, ran off with another man, uh, after being married to her husband for not that long. Um, she became friends with Hitler, and she's really into the fascist movement. She's actually imprisoned because of her beliefs, um, at Holloway. And then her sister, Deborah, who married Andrew Cavendish, who later became the Duke of Devonshire. And she wrote many books. Very interesting. And then Unity, who was really known for her friendship with Hitler. Um, yeah. And when she found, oh yeah, when she found out 
there was Britain had declared war on Germany. She actually attempted suicide, sadly, and um, failed and later died of meningitis in a hospital. So those are the Mitford sister, sisters. Um, P.G. Woodhouse is another person from this group of people in London, and he was a humorous writer who wrote over a hundred books and is really known for his Jeeves and Worcester books um, that are very patterned and predictable, but yet super humorous stories of a butler basically saving his whoever he serves, I guess. I don't know what's the name for it. He's serving the aristocrat and he basically gets Worcester out of all these sticky situations that he finds himself in. But yeah, these are the people from London and the Bright Young Society. Um, and then we're going to go to Berlin and the Bauhaus movement. Um, which was a... I already said Berlin. I was going to say which was in Berlin, but I, I'd be repeating myself, which I guess I'm doing right now. So, in mm, the 20s in Germany, modernism had a big impact. And it can be seen through the Bauhaus movement. Um, which was a movement of architecture and design. And gave us kind of the modern look. Or Ikea look that we know today. Um, this is arguably one of the most influential design movements of the time. Um, it was so innovative that... We wouldn't even recognize it as something that, like, it's so part of our, our daily houses today. It doesn't look like anything special, but it was super innovative and it's very modern. Um, yeah, now we don't even recognize the innovation in it because the Bauhaus design looks are so commonplace in our modern world. Um, if you go to Ikea, I can't kind of explain it verbally, but Ikea look, you know, very modern, very sleek, simple designs is what the Bauhaus movement was all about. And Walter Gropius was the founder of this movement and Bauhaus means the art of building. Um, Gropius says that the ultimate aim of artistic activity is building. He says, let us together create a new building of the future, which will be all in one architecture, sculpture, and painting. So that's Gropius and the Bauhaus movement. Sadly, when the Nazis came into power, Bauhaus movement kind of like wiped out in Germany, but we can say it kind of had a comeback and it's part of today, this architecture, movement, and designs. So how did small, highly connected groups of people shape the spirit of the jazz age? Is that jazz age? Why can't I say jazz age, jazz age, jazz age, jazz age, jazz age? Um, how did these, I'm gonna, re basically, we can see that, uh, the groups in London, Paris, and Berlin had a big impact in shaping what we look at as the 20s today through their aesthetics, through their architecture, and through their party scenes. So that's week 16. Thanks for tuning in. Um, that started making sense in the beginning. And then it kind of lost it, but it's okay, guys. Guys, watch the Super New Su Watch the Super Bowl tonight. Go Chiefs. Just kidding. I don't care, but really, go Chiefs, because we don't need to see Tom Brady win again. No, we don't. Um. So anyway, have a good week. Toodles. See you never. Just kidding. See you next week.